I'm not going to beat around the bush. Let me get straight down to it and tell you how to make a human being. Now, I suspect you probably know one way to do that already, and many of you may have discovered that sometimes it works very well. But I doubt whether many of you will have tried the method that I'm going to describe to you now. It appears in a book of about 1537 called De Natura Rerum, On the Nature of Things, written by the Swiss-German physician Paracelsus, or perhaps by one of his followers. Let me just explain a couple of technical terms first. A cucurbite is a round glass vessel, and venta equinus is horse dung. So, this is the recipe. Paracelsus says, Let the semen of a man putrefy by itself in a sealed cucurbite with the highest putrefaction of the venta equinus for 40 days, or until it begins at last to live, move, and be agitated, which can easily be seen. After this time, it will be in some degree like a human being, but nevertheless transparent and without body. If now, after this, it be every day nourished and fed cautiously and prudently with the arcanum of human blood and kept for 40 weeks in the perpetual and equal heat of a venter equinus, it becomes thenceforth a true and living infant, having all the members of a child that is born from a woman, but much smaller. This we call a homunculus. And it should be afterwards educated with the greatest care and zeal until it grows up and begins to display intelligence. Now this is one of the greatest secrets which God has revealed to mortal and fallible man. Well, OK, so it's a method that's not going to be to everyone's taste, but it doesn't sound that hard, does it? This is one of the most detailed accounts now known of how to create the alchemical homunculus, something that, like the transmutation of gold, several alchemists claimed to have done. The most famous of them is fictional, namely the Faust of Goethe's retelling of the legend, or more precisely, Faust's assistant Wagner, who is shown in the process of doing so here. Now, you might be inclined to regard this idea as magical mumbo-jumbo, as fantastical, mythical invention from a pre-scientific age. But it's going to be my contention here that we need to take myth, legend and magic rather seriously in this context. One reason why is the way that the most influential retelling of the Faustian tale of people-making and the retribution brought about by this dreaded act, and I'm talking, of course, about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, that this now supplies the knee-jerk journalistic shorthand for any reporting of new technologies that seem to hint at a capacity for making or modifying life, especially human life. For example, a New York Times article on in vitro fertilisation three years after Robert Edwards and Patrick Steptoe first reported the successful fertilisation of a human egg in culture had the title The Frankenstein Myth Becomes Reality. When the British government's provisional framework for regulating embryo research was released in late 1987, the Today newspaper covered it under the headline Clamp on Frankenstein Scientists. And if you think this is mere media silliness, consider the judgment of the American Catholic magazine America in the early days of IVF research. They said this, The spirit of Frankenstein did not die with the Third Reich. To produce a human being, holding it captive like a genie in a bottle, and doom it to inevitable death is to exercise an irresponsible dominion that cannot be justified by any appeal to the common welfare of mankind or to the advancement of scientific goals. I would argue that assisted reproduction continues to provoke anxiety that technological intervention in procreation might compromise the humanity of humans, that it results in a form of unnatural conception with potentially dangerous, monstrous, even blasphemous results. Robert Edwards, who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology for his work, complained in 1987 that whatever today's embryologists may do, Frankenstein or Faust or Jekyll will have foreshadowed, looming over every biological debate. But it's too simplistic to imagine, as Edward seems to, that this is just a case of media or reactionary scaremongering. When we're talking about the possibility of intervening in human procreation in some way, and perhaps in initiating it by technological means, we're entering mythical territory. 
That's to say we're broaching an idea that has been conditioned by stories and legends that probably go back beyond recorded history and which speak to some of the most deep-seated fears, preconceptions and prejudices in the human mind. If we believe we can deal with all that baggage by complaining that Frankenstein's monster keeps raising his green and flattened head, we're deluding ourselves. Most importantly, we'd be wrong to imagine that this is simply a case of hard-headed science pitted against muddle-minded populism and ignorance. Let me give you an example of why I say that. Two years after Edwards and Steptoe published their groundbreaking paper in IVF in 1969, a conference on fabricating babies, as it was called, was held in Washington, D.C. One of the eminent attendees was James Watson, the co-discoverer of DNA structure, and at that time, the director of the Cold Spring Harbour Laboratory for Research on Genetics. What he said to Edwards, also a participant at the meeting, was this. You could go ahead with your work if you accept the necessity of infanticide. There are going to be a lot of mistakes. What are we going to do about the mistakes? We have to think about some things we refuse to think about. What he had in mind was voiced more explicitly by another leading biologist at the meeting, Max Perutz, who warned how IVF might lead to, as he put it, a new thalidomide catastrophe. They both seemed convinced that IVF was going to lead to the conception and perhaps the birth of babies with severe physical abnormalities, or what would in an earlier age have been called monsters. Yet there was no evidence at all, for example, from experience up to that point with animal IVF, that this was likely. And indeed, it has proved to be a totally mistaken view. So why would even these leading scientists suspect that intervention in human conception would produce monstrosities? Well, this, at any rate, is the first of several mythical preconceptions I want to highlight about the nature of what I call anthropoia which means the technologies of making humans. This myth is the artificial person will be monstrous. The important point here is not simply to recognise that technologies like IVF have provoked misguided fears and criticisms, but to think about the forms those fears have taken. Behind the condemnations seems to lurk an unarticulated idea about naturalness and its violation. That's something expressed very directly by one of the interviewees in a poll on assisted conception conducted in 1969 for Life magazine. I find something oddly admirable in the way this, quote, mother of three in Toledo, Ohio, accessed so directly the mythical ingredients that hide behind a veneer of learning in the remarks of some academics both then and now. Asked if she would contemplate having a child by IVF, she replied, I just wouldn't feel the child was mine. It might sprout horns or wings or something. And in case you feel this all sounds a bit dated today when more than 4 million babies worldwide have been born by IVF, let me just remind you where popular culture currently stands with the people-making technologies of our day, which are cloning and genetic manipulation of embryos. This is the kind of image that we see associated with these technologies. Where do we start in trying to understand the origins of this kind of imagery? We might begin with Prometheus, the titan who challenged the Olympian gods. After all, what did Mary Shelley call Victor Frankenstein but a modern Prometheus? Now, the point about Prometheus is not just that he transgressed against the gods by giving humankind fire and paid a terrible price. Prometheus also gave humans technology, and with it, the ability to plan for the future. His very name comes from the Greek promathane, which means to think ahead. And in some versions of the myth, Prometheus is said to have in fact created humankind himself. One of the messages of that myth is therefore that technology is perilous, that it's inherently Faustian. This is a point made also in the legends of the great inventor Daedalus, who could allegedly animate statues into a semblance of life. It was Daedalus who, by enabling Minos' wife Pacify to mate with a bull, instigated the creation of the half-human monster, the Minotaur. 
And of course, Daedalus too paid a bitter price for his technological brilliance, since his son was killed through one of his marvellous inventions, the wings they used to escape from Minos's prison on Crete. Both of these mythical allusions were made by the British biologist J.B.S. Haldane in a 1924 book called Daedalus, or Science and the Future. Here, Haldane said, The chemical or physical inventor is always a Prometheus. There is no great invention, from fire to flying, which has not been hailed as an insult to some god. But if every physical and chemical invention is a blasphemy, every biological invention is a perversion. There is hardly one which, on first being brought to the notice of an observer from any nation which had not previously heard of their existence, would not appear to him as indecent and unnatural. Here, then, is my second mythical preconception about Anthropoea. Technology is inherently perverting. That idea can be found in the opposition to IVF that appears in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it says this and nearly all methods of assisted conception are morally unacceptable, and it gives the following reasons. They disassociate the sexual act from the procreative act. The act which brings the child into existence is no longer an act by which two persons give themselves to one another, but one that entrusts the life and identity of the embryo into the power of doctors and biologists, and establishes the domination of technology over the origin and destiny of the human person. Of course, one might object that in general, when IVF is used to address infertility, then without those doctors and this technology, there is no human person, no embryo to be dominated, no origin on destiny to speak of. But this domination of technology is evidently held here to be bad. There seems to be no room for the possibility that the doctors and the technology might be working towards the good namely the provision of a much-wanted child. Rather, technology creates an indelible stain on the origin and destiny of any person in whose conception it intervenes. The same notion is clear in Pope Pius XII's judgment on artificial insemination, which can be read as a preemptive attack on IVF too. He said, To reduce the shared life of a married couple and the act of married love to a mere organic activity for transmitting semen would be like turning the domestic home, the sanctuary of the family, into a biological laboratory. Of course, artificial insemination does not really turn the home into a biological laboratory. Many people have achieved it with the simplest of aids in their own homes, with not a lab-coated scientist in sight. What the Pope really wants to imply here is that assisted conception makes procreation a matter of ugly biological fact. And worse than that, for there's no doubt that we're meant to regard the biological laboratory as a sinister place in which perverse and unnatural things happen. If he had said merely that the act of married lovemaking had become a matter of biology, the effect would have been far weaker. We'd be inclined to respond that, of course, biology is involved. But the laboratory is a place of manipulation, a place where, it's suggested here, nature is traduced. That's a prejudice evident in the homunculus tradition, although in a more subtle way. Surprisingly, perhaps, much of the theological and philosophical unease about claims to make homunculi centred not so much on the alleged hubris, what we now like to call playing God, but on the status of the created being. There was a long tradition of debate, going back to Plato and Aristotle, about whether human craft and technology, or what in times past would simply called art, could generate products that were equivalent to those in nature. For Plato, art was inferior and possibly even iniquitous in its deception, whereas Aristotle implied that some art might augment and bring to completion things that nature itself could not finish. This debate was brought into focus by challenges to the alchemist's claim to make gold. The objection was not that it wasn't gold, but that it wasn't as good as natural gold. So what about the homunculus then? Again, one position was that these beings were alive, but lacked the perfection of creatures produced by natural means. Some said that living organisms created by humans were infertile. That remains a common preconception. It was widely assumed, wrongly and for no reason, that Dolly the sheep would be infertile too. 
More significantly, however, the homunculus was thought to lack a soul. In fact, one of the reasons why churchmen were uncomfortable with the idea was that the soulless homunculus might be considered to force God's hand to compel him to give it one. Or alternatively, since the homunculus was a person not descended from Adam and not possessing an immortal soul, it might be considered, heretically, to be free from original sin. So then we get this next mythical preconception. The artificial person has no soul. And if this seems an archaic notion, just bear in mind this note of protest left on the car of a Californian fertility doctor when he started providing an IVF service in the 1970s. It said, test tube babies have no souls. The homunculus in Goethe's Faust isn't completely human, and yet it yearns to be. He is doomed to remain confined within his glass bottle unless he can find a way to become fully human. But he's not inferior in all respects. In some ways, he occupies a higher state of being. He possesses magical powers. And he's presented sympathetically by Goethe, a kind of personification of the liberated human intellect. Yet even that still serves to illustrate my next proposition, which is that the artificial person is not like a normal person, but either sub or superhuman, or both. But Goethe's rather positive depiction of the artificial person was already eclipsed by the time he published the second part of Faust in 1832, the final year of his life, because by then there was a much more resonant and famous story about Anthropoia in popular culture. Goethe's Faust is explicitly based on a medieval alchemical model of Anthropoia, but Frankenstein claimed to offer a modern view of the procedure. Percy Shelley wrote in his introduction to the first edition of the book in 1818 that the event on which this fiction is founded has been supposed by Dr Darwin and some of the physiological writers of Germany as not of impossible occurrence. Dr Darwin here is, needless to say, not Charles, but his grandfather Erasmus, one of the leading zoologists of the late 18th century, who had hinted that life might be created by artificial means. Now, Mary Shelley notoriously said very little about how Victor made his monster, and it's tempting to ridicule this image of a young student who, after reading some old alchemical books and then attending a few undergraduate lectures on chemistry, somehow discovers the secret of how to reanimate dead body parts stitched together. But in retrospect, the decision to skimp on the details was wise, since there's nothing Shelley could have said about it that wouldn't seem absurdly naive now. Although the sparks and thunderstorms are largely the invention of Hollywood, it does seem clear that Shelley wanted us to think that electricity was involved. And for good reason, because it was only shortly before she wrote the book, begun at the age of 18, we must remember, that the Italian physiologist Luigi Galvani had shown that he could stimulate frogs' amputated limbs into a semblance of life using electrical pulses. Even more dramatically, Galvani's nephew Luigi Aldini demonstrated the electrical reanimation of a severed ox's head in front of the Prince of Wales and other nobles in 1802. Even more compelling and disturbing was Aldini's experiment in 1803 in which he seemed to restore some brief semblance of life in the corpse of a criminal who had recently been hanged at Newgate Prison in London and was brought swiftly to the College of Surgeons. Now, this is how Aldini described that experiment. He said, The jaw began to quiver, the adjoining muscles were horribly contorted, and the left eye actually opened. The action even of those muscles furthest distant from the points of contact with the arc was so much increased almost to give an appearance of reanimation. Vitality might perhaps have been restored if many circumstances had not rendered it impossible. There's a great deal I could say about what Frankenstein did for the myth of Anthropoia, but I, I want just to make a few points. First, this is a secular story. Despite allusions to impiety and to tempting God, there are no supernatural forces at play, and the retribution brought upon Faust by the devil here is enacted by the monster itself. Second, the success of the story depended on popularisation and vulgarisation, and it did so long before Hollywood got hold of it. The first edition of the book didn't sell especially well. 
but within seven years there were sensationally popular stage productions in London in which the storyline was already pretty much rewritten from scratch. Third, Frankenstein's monster in these adaptations for stage and screen was not the eloquent, almost noble creature Mary Shelley described, but was made mute and childlike, an insistence that this artificial being must be seen to be deeply inferior to ourselves. In early stage versions, like this one, the creature is a wild, grunting, almost naked savage. But of course, the most famous depiction was that by Boris Karloff in James Whale's seminal screen adaptation from 1931. Here, with its unnatural colour, its jerky motions, its flattened head and bolted on neck, the monster has taken on some of the attributes of that other great symbol of the artificial person in the 20th century, the robot. It's widely known that the word robot is derived from the Czech word for labourer since it first appeared in the 1921 play R.U.R. by the Czech writer Karol Čapek. What's less widely recognised is that Čapek's robots were not like the metal humanoids of Fritz Lang's Metropolis six years later. They were made from flesh and blood. They were invented by a man called Rossum and the play's title is the name of his company, Rossum's Universal Robots. Their organs and nerves and bones and so forth are all made in separate vats from a kind of fleshy dough and then assembled like the cars that were rolling off Henry Ford's production line at that time. And this is the key insight of Chapek's play because he recognised that making people in the 20th century would no longer be the kind of solitary pseudo-alchemical enterprise that it was for Victor Frankenstein, but would be done on an industrial scale and for commercial gain. As RUR's Director General Harry Domin says, making artificial people is an industrial secret. Besides this, RUR rehearses all the standard themes of the artificial person. Domin has Promethean ambitions, in this case being to, to free humankind from the drudgery of everyday labour. But the robots, although generally subservient, asexual and soulless creatures eventually rebel and kill all the humans so that they might take over the world. In doing so, they acquire a soul, but this is presented not as a real gain, but as a kind of fall, an injection of original sin, giving them a human's capacity to act in inhumane ways. The most influential vision of the artificial mass production of people, however, appeared 11 years after RUR premiered. This was, of course, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, in which people are not assembled on the production line, but are grown in test tubes and jars from fertilised human eggs. This in vitro gestation wasn't Huxley's idea. It was a notion being seriously discussed by biologists when he wrote the book, most notably by J.B.S. Haldane in his 1924 book Daedalus, as I mentioned earlier, and by Aldous Huxley's brother, Julian, who was one of the leading scientists of the age, and incidentally was the grandson of Charles Darwin's staunch supporter, Thomas Henry Huxley. Haldane and Julian Huxley imagined that this process, called ectogenesis, might be used to liberate women from childbearing and that it could therefore be used to increase the birth rate amongst educated, intelligent women who they considered to be the best genetic stock in the population. In this way, ectogenesis, what you might more graphically call babies in bottles, ectogenesis was seen to be a technique that would usher in both the emancipation of women and eugenic social engineering. Like many leading scientists of the time, Haldane and Huxley were enthusiastic advocates of eugenics, which they considered to be the only way to prevent a steady decline in the gene pool of the human race due to overbreeding by genetically inferior individuals. Although it's often assumed that eugenics was abandoned as a disreputable idea after eugenic policies were pursued by the Nazi regime, in fact it was still being actively promoted by some scientists, including Julian Huxley, in the 1960s. In the early part of the century, the idea was embraced by many states in the United States, where around 60,000 people were sterilised because of eugenic laws. Several feminists in the 1920s and 30s welcomed ectogenesis as an emancipating technology, 
It was wholeheartedly supported also by Shulamith Firestone in her 1970 book, The Dialectic of Sex, which is now considered one of the central texts of modern feminism. But others worried, and they continue to worry today, that it would undermine one of the last preserves of female power and autonomy, the ability to bear children. In response to Haldane's book, meanwhile, the conservative social critic Antony Ludovici fretted that because, in principle, one man could fertilise thousands of eggs for ectogenesis, it would lead to a culling of males and a matriarchal society. So here's another one for our list. Making artificial people will lead to the eradication of men or women. Here are some headlines that are reflecting that idea. In Aldous Huxley's novel, the social engineering made possible by ectogenesis is taken to its dystopian conclusion. The intelligence and abilities of the population are strictly controlled in a several-tiered caste system by chemical control of the gestation process. Given the time in which Huxley was writing, with totalitarian regimes on the rise in Europe and the Soviet Union, Brave New World presented what seemed like a timely warning. But it is still seized upon today, regardless of our very different political context, as an off-the-shelf apocalyptic scenario to accompany every advance in reproductive technology. The science reporter for Time magazine in the 1970s, David Rorvik, set the tone in the title of his 1971 book on the subject. Here it is. And there are endless examples of how the media has referred to Huxley's imagined future all along the way from IVF to cloning. Here are some examples of that. And so here again is another mythical archetype for Anthropoia. That is that making artificial people will be used for social engineering by totalitarian states. And I might add another implication from Huxley's book where the babies gestated in bottles are reared by the state rather than by their genetic parents. So the idea is that making artificial people will destroy the family. And here are some examples of that idea in the wake of IVF. Of course, you might find it odd that a technique designed at the outset to allow married couples with infertility problems to have children was being seen as a method that would destroy rather than create families. But we should never underestimate the power of unconscious notions about naturalness and unnaturalness. There is magical and mythical thinking at work here, evident, for example, in the way that around 40% of adults in the life poll that I mentioned earlier thought that children conceived by IVF would not feel love for their family. And think about the way that's phrased, that way round, not that the family wouldn't love them, but that the children wouldn't be able to feel love for the family. The issue, as these remarks imply, is not whether family units will be created by assisted conception, but whether they would be created in the right way. As IVF began to seem a real possibility in the late 1960s, a new fear appeared. In the shadow of Nazism, it seemed conceivable that techniques like this would lead to what some called the creation of a master race. In part, this is an extension of the fear voiced in Chapek's RUR that artificial people will take over the world. But now the idea that the artificial person will be malevolent and hungry for dominance had a new face. And so we have our next myth. Making artificial people will lead to the resurrection of Hitler. These days, it's not uncommon for our new bogeymen to be substituted in place of the Fuhrer so that we might see worries about the cloning of Saddam Hussein or Osama bin Laden. Just as in 1971, the American bioethicist Leon Cass warned about what he called the asexual reproduction of 10,000 Mao Zedongs. But Hitler remains the perennial favourite for this sort of thing, partly thanks to Ira Levin's 1976 novel The Boys from Brazil, in which Hitler is cloned by Joseph Mengele hiding in Brazil. When you think about it for a moment, the idea is so risible that you might wonder why it has persisted for, fo for so long. For one thing, it posits an absurd amount of genetic determinism, as though Hitler was destined from birth to devise the final solution. As for an entire army of this physically undistinguished man, I'm not sure that we'd have much to fear from that, although it does have some comic potential. Ideas this silly couldn't last for long unless they were planted in the fertile soil of myth, which here is at root a myth about metempsychosis, 
the transmigration of souls. So, here we are then, with the modern version of Anthropoia, human reproductive cloning. This has already absorbed all the standard preconceptions about the artificial human that I've so far described. One doesn't have to be an advocate of human cloning to see that many of the objections to it are based on the same old myths. One reason why this is profoundly misguided is that the dangers of abuses of such technologies today stem not from the brave new worlds of totalitarian states, but from the free market. There's a danger that the political sensitivity of the matter, as with IVF and embryo research, will lead to a situation where politicians simply refuse to take responsibility in the public sector while allowing laissez-faire in the private sector. That's not good. For one thing we can say for sure about all of these reproductive technologies is that they need to be regulated. So, should human cloning be allowed? Well, I'd respond to that question with another. The issue is not, is human cloning right or wrong, but why would you want to do it? It would seem misguided to decide the issue on the basis of some general notions of right or wrong or natural and unnatural, rather than looking at the specifics of the situation. Perhaps the more pertinent question is, will human cloning happen? I think the answer will be yes, and probably within the lifetimes of some of us. Some say it's already happened, but these claims are made by the kinds of mavericks and egotists who will always appear when society as a whole refuses to take a lead. One of them is this company called CloneAid, and you'd never think from this advert that CloneAid is run from some shady location in the Bahamas, funded by a cult which believes that humans were created by aliens. CloneAid alleged that it created the first cloned child in 2002, and although you shouldn't believe a word of it, let me say that occasionally CloneAid's press statements have much more of a plausible ring to them, like this one. It says, CloneAid has received cloning requests from around the world. A surprisingly large number come from the Los Angeles Hollywood area. If reproductive human cloning happens, for better or worse, many people will doubtless be surprised that the cloned person is a normal human being, who may not even look identical to the genetic donor. Just as many were surprised when the first IVF baby, Louise Brown, was born in 1978. The philosopher Gregory Pence, who advocates human cloning and offers one of the best argued cases for why there should be no fundamental ethical objections to it, even thinks that the word clone to refer to such a person should be considered prejudicial, akin to the racist slurs of the past. Certainly there's no reason that we know of why a person made by cloning would not gestate and develop in the same way as all of us did, and why they should not be born to loving parents. Of course, they would be normal, if we let them be. But we've insisted endlessly that they won't be, even in relatively thoughtful fictionalizations, like the novel Solution 3 by Naomi Mitchison, who happened to be J.B.S. Haldane's sister. Now it is clones, not homunculi or robots or test tube babies, who are uncanny, spiritually vacant, lacking a soul or a true spark of humanity. Well then, here are some of the key myths of Anthropoia. And when we encounter them in the debates about assisted conception, reproductive technologies and embryo research, we should become alert to the fact that the debate has most probably departed from reality and entered mythical territory. We needn't be surprised to find them very much in evidence in the movies and to a lesser degree in fiction. But while that certainly helps to propagate them and can cloud the argument, I don't think we need lament it too loudly. I think we're mostly sophisticated enough to know that myth is the currency of movies, even if they don't always have the wit to realise that themselves. We should be far more concerned when these myths manifest themselves unannounced in the proclamations on these topics that come from moralists, religious leaders, politicians and, as we've seen, sometimes even from scientists. Why do we so resolutely insist on these myths? I believe that they are all expressions of a sense that anthropoia is unnatural. Whether it's Frankensteinian necrosurgery or Huxleyan ectogenesis, IVF or cloning, 
Artificial intervention in human procreation has always provoked outrage and disgust at first encounter because it's often held to be the ultimate unnatural act. And to call something unnatural is not an act of taxonomy, but a moral judgment. The unnatural act is something we're supposed to condemn. I contend that much of this disapproval stems from the theological tradition called natural law, which Thomas Aquinas formulated in the 13th century. Natural law plays out in a rationalistic and yet teleological universe in which everything has a part to play, and all things have a natural end, which, being ordained by God, is intrinsically good. The natural end of sex is procreation, since traditionally that's where it was apt to lead. Religious objections to IVF and forms of reproductive technology which don't require sexual intercourse invoke this reasoning in reverse. The natural and therefore the only permissible beginning of procreation is sex, which is to say not sex in the biological sense of sperm meeting egg, but in the anatomical sense of what goes where. If you examine that position closely, so to speak, it's not hard to uncover some extraordinarily perverse consequences. Much of this thinking is now buried beneath the surface of certain codes and formulas, in which, for example, the Frankenstein label supplies an invitation to find something wicked, debased, even blasphemous, closing off any further debate. Yet perhaps it's no surprise that the cultural stock of Frankenstein still seems to be riding high. For example, as shown by the recent staging by Danny Boyle of Frankenstein at the National Theatre, or more recently by this film. I think one reason for this is that the decoding of the human genome, or more precisely, the misleading insistence by some of the genomic community that this is the biological blueprint for humanity, that this confronts us with the unsettling question that electrical and chemical physiology seemed to raise in Mary Shelley's time. The question... Is this all we are? But I believe that Shelley's novel also offers a response to that question. There's an interpretation of her story that is far more useful, relevant, and dare I say, even true, than seeing it as just a Faustian tale about scientific hubris. You see, it's when the creature lives alongside the de Lacy family and eventually talks with the blind father of that family that he is eloquent, gentle, loving, and more human than ever. And conversely, it's when Victor Frankenstein cuts himself off from his family and fiancée to pursue his obsession that he becomes monstrous. Our humanity, Shelley seems to be saying here, lies not in our material fabric or origins, not in our flesh or our genes, but in the matter of how we inhabit the world in community with our fellow beings. It is there and not in the material details of how and when our individual lives begin, that I believe we must seek our ethical guidance about new means of procreation. Mm -hmm.